Madam President, I, uh, too, rise in strong support of the pending trade agreements with America's allies, Colombia, South Korea, and Panama. These agreements hold great promise for American farmers, manufacturers, service providers, and American consumers. And I would echo what my uh, colleague from Oregon, who does chair the Subcommittee on Trade on the Finance Committee, has already said, and that is that these trade agreements position American businesses to capture more of that supply chain, to enable us to create jobs here at home, and to, to grow the economy, to generate economic activity out there that otherwise we wouldn't see happening. And so at a time when we need to focus our efforts on measures that will promote economic growth and job creation, these agreements are exactly the type of legislation that we ought to be considering. And there's broad consensus that these agreements are going to benefit our economy. The Obama White House estimates, estimates that enactment of these three trade agreements will boost exports by at least $12 billion, supporting over 70,000 American jobs. The Business Roundtable estimates that passage of these trade agreements will support as many as 250,000 American jobs. And these are not the only jobs that large businesses, but increasingly at smaller companies that are accessing international markets. And just as an example of that, more than 35,000 small business, small I should say, and mid-sized American businesses export to Colombia, Panama, and South Korea. And these firms now account for more than one-third of U.S. exports to these countries. Passing these three trade agreements will provide export opportunities to American businesses of all sizes, creating good-paying jobs here at home. The benefits to U.S. agriculture of passing these agreements are especially compelling. These three agreements are estimated to represent $3 billion in new agricultural exports that will support 22,500 U.S. agricultural-related jobs. My state of South Dakota is a good example. If you look at the export potential for U.S. agriculture that represented by these agreements, according to the American Farm Bureau Federation, these agreements will add $52 million each year to South Dakota's farm economy. South Dakota is projected to gain $22 million from increased beef exports, $25 million from increased exports of wheat, soybeans, and corn, and $5 million from increased uh, pork shipments each year. America's market has already largely opened imports from many of our trading partners. In fact, almost 99 percent of agricultural products from Colombia and Panama, for example, enter the United States duty-free. Without trade agreements to ensure similar treatment for our exporters, American businesses will continue to face high tariff and non-tariff barriers abroad. Consider just one example, and that's the market for agricultural products in Korea, which is the world's 13th largest economy. Korea's tariffs on imported agricultural goods average 54 percent, compared to an average of 9 percent tariff on, these, on their imports into the United States. So passage of the Korea Free Trade Agreement will level this playing field. Think about that, Madam President. 54% for our exporters to get into the Korean market, 9% tariff for their exports coming here. That is a huge discrepancy that will be rectified by passage of this agreement. Korea's market for pork products in particular underscores how removing barriers to trade can benefit U.S. farmers and ranchers. U.S. pork exports to Korea, South Korea, have increased 130 percent from January to July of this year because Korea temporarily lifted its 25 percent duty on pork imports due, an out, due to an outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Korea. During this period, the Korean market surpassed Canada to become the third largest export destination for U.S. pork producers after Japan and Mexico. Korea's tariff on pork imports is expected to return, but would be permanently eliminated by 2016 under the terms of the U.S. and South Korea Free Trade Agreement. So that we know that when we eliminate barriers to U.S. exports, American producers will compete and win in the global marketplace. However, if we fail to act and continue to delay implementation of these agreements, the cost to our economy will also be substantial. The United States Chamber of Commerce study warns that failure to enact the three pending trade agreements could threaten as many as 380,000 American jobs and the loss of $40 billion in sales. The cost of inaction on trade is high because today we live in a global economy where American producers rely on access to foreign markets. Consider that in 1960, exports accounted for only 3.6% of our entire GDP. Today, 
Exports account for 12.5 percent of our entire GDP. Exports of U.S. goods and services support over 10 million American jobs. When America stands still on trade, the rest of the world does not. Madam President, today there are more than 100 new free trade agreements that are currently under negotiation around the world. Yet in the United States, we're only party to one of those negotiations, and that's the Trans-Pacific Partnership. If we do not aggressively pursue new market opening agreements on behalf of American workers, we will see new export opportunities go to foreign businesses and foreign workers. Unfortunately, that is exactly what we have experienced under the current administration. The three trade agreements that we're considering today were signed over four years ago, and this administration had more than two and a half years to submit them to Congress for consideration, but failed to do so. Instead, the President chose to sit on these agreements and not send them to Congress for nearly now 1,000 days. Now, we cannot quantify precisely the cost of this unfortunate delay, but we know that it's put American exporters at a competitive disadvantage in the Colombian, Korean, and Panamanian markets. For example, on July 1st, the Euro European Union-Korea trade agreement went into effect. In just the first months after this agreement took effect, EU exports to Korea jumped nearly 37 percent, while U.S. exports to Korea rose by only 3 percent. Now, let's be clear about what this means, Madam President. Korean consumers are choosing to buy German, French, and British cars, electronics, and agricultural products rather than American-made products because those European products now have a price advantage. This was entirely preventable if we'd acted on the U.S.-Korea trade agreement sooner. Likewise, the Canada-Columbia agreement went into effect on August 15th of this year. This is resulting in an advantage for Canadian goods, such as construction equipment, aircraft, and a range of other industrial and agricultural products. Colombia is now reporting that since the Canada-Columbia trade agreement took effect, there's been an 18.3 percent increase in Colombian imports of Canadian wheat. Much as with Korea, U.S. businesses are finding themselves disadvantaged because the President waited so long before sending these agreements to Congress. Unfortunately, the negative impact of the Canada-Columbia agreement on U.S. exporters is just a continuation of the lost export opportunities we've seen over the past few years as these trade agreements have lingered. Just a few years ago, American wheat producers dominated the market in Colombia with a 73 percent market share as of 2008. Today we are facing a situation where U.S. wheat producers are likely to be completely shut out of the Colombian market if we don't act. Hopefully by passing these agreements today and by swiftly implementing the U.S.-Columbia Trade Promotion Agreement, our wheat producers will be able to recover much of their lost market share. But they should never have been placed in this position to begin with. In 2010, for the first time in the history of U.S.-Columbia trade, the U.S. lost to Argentina its position as Colombia's number one agricultural supplier. Now let's consider the story of three of the major crops that we grow in South Dakota, soybean, corn, and wheat. The combined market share in Colombia for these three U.S. agricultural exports has decreased from 78% in 2008 to 28% as of 2010, a staggering decline of 50 percentage points in our market share. U.S. corn sales to Colombia fell from 3 million metric tons in 2007 to 700,000 metric tons in 2010. This is the high cost, Madam President, of delay while our trading partners pursue new regional and bilateral trade agreements. There's also been the cost of duties that have been paid on U.S. exports while these agreements waited. There's a, U.S. companies have paid more than $5 billion in tariffs to Colombia and Panama since the trade agreements with these nations were signed more than four years ago. Now let's consider the cost of delay to just one of U.S. One, one American company, and that's Caterpillar. We all know Caterpillar is a leading producer of large construction and mining equipment and a major U.S. exporter. Caterpillar exports 92 percent of its American-made large mining trucks. Caterpillar's large trucks export, large truck exports, I should say, to Colombia face a 15 percent duty, which adds about $300,000 to the cost of each of these trucks exported to Colombia. I mean, how does that work, Madam President? Think about that. Every truck that Caterpillar sends into the, the, the Colombian market, it's an additional $300,000 on top of the, the cost of that piece of equipment for the tariff 
that has to be paid. Just imagine the advantage that Caterpillar could have had for the last several years over its Japanese and Chinese competitors if the House of Representatives, that at the time was controlled by the Democrats back in 2008, had not refused to consider the Columbia Agreement when President Bush submitted it, or if the current administration had acted sooner. And that is just one example of countless others out there with American businesses. And so I'm glad that we're here today, and I expect all three trade agreements to pass with what I hope is broad bipartisan support. I hope we also have learned an important lesson. We cannot afford to delay when it comes to international competition and trade. I hope the White House has learned an important lesson as well. Rather than submitting to Congress divisive measures where there are fundamental disagreements, such as new tax increases, this administration should identify measures such as these trade bills that will spur our economy and where there is broad bipartisan agreement. The President sent his American Jobs Act to Congress exactly a month ago today, yet we only just last night voted on whether we should consider this bill, a vote that did not get a single Republican, and it didn't get every Democrat vote either. Now contrast that approach with these free trade agreements which were submitted to Congress by the President on October 3rd, just nine days ago. Within about a week and a half, these trade agreements will have passed the relevant committees and the House and the Senate with large bipartisan votes and will be on the President's desk awaiting his signature. Clearly, reaching across the aisle on measures where both parties can find agreement is a much more effective approach. And so I would urge my colleagues to support these job-creating trade bills based upon their merits. I would also urge my colleagues to support these bills to send a message that when this administration is willing to send us common sense, pro-growth legislation, we are ready and willing to pass it. We can only hope that our votes today on these trade agreements will set that precedent. So Madam President, I look forward to voting for these long overdue agreements on behalf of American businesses and consumers. And I look forward, hopefully, to being able to, being able to act on what are truly pro-growth job measures in the coming weeks and months. We have an economy that continues to struggle with over 9% unemployment. We continue to see month after month a lot of Americans who are without jobs and this is one example of something that we can do to address that concern but there are lots of other things out there that we could be doing as well Madam President if we're willing to identify those things on which there is agreement and those types of policies that actually do create jobs that are about getting Americans back to work, not, by, not about making some, some sort of a political statement. I hope that will be, this will set a pattern and a trend uh, that will be replicated in the future and that we can do some things that are really good for American economy and for American jobs. Madam President, I yield the floor.